uh, thanks everyone for uh, maybe a slight change of pace from the rapid fire lightning talks, which have been really informative and and um, kind of drinking from the fire hose. So maybe a chance to uh, take a deep breath and and have a conversation about public and private collaboration uh, in in the world of OpenStreetMap, uh, specifically not using public private partnerships because that may give a, an incorrect connotation of what we're trying to discuss here. It's how do we work better together and not necessarily rely on some of the red tape or contracts or other issues that can come with partnership versus collaboration. And so the panel today is going to uh, discuss lessons learned, uh, opportunities, and maybe what we could all do better in order to collaborate amongst the different groups. We have representatives from USGS, from the State Department, uh, MapGiv, and also from Maxar talking about the open data program. Um, I know we are running just a few minutes behind, but uh, I'm only saying that because I, I bet somebody that that would happen and I'm gonna cash in on it at some point soon. Uh, so I wanna get right into it and, and give all of our uh, panelists a chance to introduce themselves, to talk about their uh, interactions with either the public or the, the private world. And then we'll have opportunity at the end for uh, some questions, answers uh, and discussion. So first, I'm going to introduce Aaron Corris, who is part of the TNM Corps uh, over at USGS. Uh, Aaron, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, great. Can you hear me and see me okay? Awesome. Sure. Um, thanks a lot for having us. Uh, I'm Aaron Corris. I work at the USGS at the National Geospatial Technical Operations Center. Um, I've been there for 10 years and I've worked on crowdsourcing for most of that time. Um, I'm currently the project lead for the National Map Corps, which is our crowdsourcing effort um, for the national map. So I'm gonna just give an overview of National Map Corps, what we do, and talk a little bit about the ways we've um, worked with uh, OSM in the past. Um, so like I said, National Map Corps is crowdsourcing for the national map. So hopefully everyone's familiar with the national map. Um, National Map has a lot of data, public domain data that is downloadable. Um, and we also produce the US Topo Maps, which are a signature product for the USGS. Um, similar to OpenStreetMap, but a much more limited scope and much more controlled editing. Um, we have volunteers editing in all 50 states, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Uh, currently, it's focused on structures collection, so those are point features for buildings. Um, and like I said, we have a pretty limited scope, so the types of features we collect are what you'd want to see on the U.S. topo map, so important community anchor point types of features, schools, emergency response, um, such as fire stations and law enforcement, hospitals, um, some government features, cemeteries, post offices, um, that sort of stuff. And so again, the, the US topo maps are updated every three years. And so we've been working towards a complete, consistent, um, accurate data set for um, that limited set of features. Um, and most importantly, the data is public domain. So the data is available to anyone to download and use however they please. Um, the project, our project has been successful in part due to our really simple collection criteria, um, really clear guidelines online, very limited information we're asking for and specific. So name and location are the only required information and volunteers are placing points based on um, aerial imagery in our application. And they can also provide address information. We have a tiered editing approach. so. Anyone can sign up right away, start editing. Um, we have peer reviewers check um, those editors points. So it goes through a second review. Those um, volunteers have been um, uh, vetted. So they have, um, we've reviewed their data and granted them that role. We also have advanced editors who um, have a lot of experience and very high quality data and their data can bypass peer review. So it doesn't have to be reviewed by anyone. Um, and we get very high quality data um, through that process. We do quality monitoring. So we check volunteers points, um, new editors especially provide feedback if we see any issues. Um, and we see coming out of even that first um, stage, the standard editor, editor first tier, um, we see 94% quality or better for location and name. 
Um, and uh, I know I'm kind of getting short on time, so I'll just say um, we have over 600,000 volunteer contributions and we've had 25 um, people contribute, 2,500 people contribute since 2016. In terms of how we've worked with OSM, in the early days we worked with OSM quite a bit. Jim McAndrews was one of the first um, developers that worked on this project when he was at USGS. And during our pilot projects, we used um, OpenStreetMap editors that we customized, so Potlatch and Jossum. And then our primary application that we used until 2016 was a customized Potlatch 2 application. Um, we went to an internally developed application in 2016 to improve our processes and speed up the integration of volunteers at its indoor databases. Um, and that's a combo of open source and proprietary software. Um, in terms of working with OSM, the primary barrier to collaboration has been incompatible data licenses. Um, the fact that we're public domain has caused some, uh, has been a bit of a hindrance to collaborating. However, we're currently trying to reconnect with the OSM community and talking to them to do a possible pilot. And I'm going to uh, be quiet because I think I've hit my time and Greg's going to talk more about that. So yes, I was going to say that was a, a perfect segue uh, when we get to Greg <laughs> at the end to talk about sort of barriers and, and kind of revisiting. Um, there's a lot of good, good content there um, and, and some good, hopefully, things people are thinking about to ask some questions. Um, what I want to do is, is pivot over to Erica uh, Nunez from uh, Mapkin uh, to now also talk about from a different perspective uh, how that agency is working with OpenStreetMap and working with a community that also contributes back to it. So Erica. Hi, thank you, Josh. Um, I wanted to really quickly say that I'm really happy to be speaking with everyone today because it was actually um, getting sent to a State of the Map US conference a handful of years ago in DC that really opened my eyes. To the potential around open mapping. So it's always very nice to come back and it feels very full circle. But um, but my name is Erica Nunez and I'm a humanitarian research analyst and I've been, in, I've been embedded in the US Department of State's Office of the Geographer and its Humanitarian Information Unit for more than a few years now. And I've been working with them on advancing a department-wide initiative that they uh, manage called the MapGiv Initiative. And so for anyone that doesn't know, the MapGive Initiative is a US Department of State public diplomacy initiative that launched in 2014 that specifically encourages and increases participation in the global mapping community, open mapping community, and helps to facilitate the creation of geographic data to support humanitarian relief and development programs specifically. And so a lot of what we do is build bridges between the State Department, which obviously has a global reach and with its resources and programming and personnel, um, we build bridges between the department and the open mapping community to find opportunities where we can constructively contribute towards humanitarian development efforts. And since the theme of our panel is um, a private public um, collaboration, I'll quickly plug that it's been interesting. Um, we launched back in 2014 and as the private sector is increasingly involved or increasingly interested, in open mapping, we, you know, there are obviously there are more opportunities there for us to make um, to make connections, and making connections is um, very central to our mission. And so, I might just quickly describe the three main avenues that we take to um, to approach our work, and hopefully, that'll make it clear how important network building and relationship building um, really is to us. And so the, the first thing that we do is we try to leverage whatever unique capabilities the State Department has to try to strengthen the open mapping community's efforts. And so the clearest example of this is through our um, imagery to the crowd program, where we share updated high res satellite imagery um, through licenses that we have. And we could have a whole separate panel on that. But, um, but for the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll continue. Um, so we, second of all, we help the State Department organize events with local communities for that are centered around mapping. Um, we've helped organize dozens of mapathons around the world and um, at US-based universities as well, um, just because they're great opportunities to get local governments, students, teachers, GIS professionals, international organizations, you know, private companies, um, anybody with um, a genuine interest um, in the room um, and working on the same cause. And the third thing that we do is we 
very intentionally work to identify um, and create short and long-term opportunities where open mapping can exist, can support existing State Department programs and goals. And so we've done that pretty um, successfully by trying to integrate open mapping into um, existing STEM and education related events and projects. So we've, um, for instance, I should, I should say projects and um, programs. And um, for instance, MapGive, we've helped connect to connect um, the YALI, the Young African Leaders Initiative alumni with open mapping. We've worked with um, the Americans, with the American Spaces um, specifically in El Salvador to bring open mapping into existing STEM programs that they had for high school girls. In previous years, we've participated in things like um, women in science STEAM camps and tech camps in different parts of the world. And so we're really, 96 and so we're really working on identifying opportunities within the department. And so this is to say there's enormous potential here. And so we have a huge incentive to to be well informed on existing projects and on um, you know sort of exciting developments in the open mapping and GIS community, and to have this really robust network, um, and our you know internal and external geo diplomacy really depends on it. And we'll say that one of the questions that we still frequently get is to the quality and the reliability of crowdsourced and open data. Um, and it's clear that's a value that that data needs to be reliable. And so we definitely share everyone's goal of wanting to be sure that there's good quality data in OpenStreetMap. And um, because we have this, um, this relationship with Maxar, because we know these people, we've worked, um, we worked with them in conferences like these, and we have this existing relationship, we were able to talk with them about what tools they had available at the beginning of this summer. We were able to talk to them what, about what they are doing um, you know, as everyone was pivoting towards responding to COVID-19. And we ended up having these really regular conversations um, about machine learning and mapathons. And we were able to just explore the possibilities um, about how to incorporate it into our plans. And we ended up reaching out to PEPFAR and connecting um, machine learning tools that Maxer had available to them that were specific to data quality and OSM priority areas for PEPFAR, um, which focuses on public health, um, priority areas for them in Nigeria. And we were able to create an event where um, we pointed um, students in Nigeria and the United States and um, our you know, classic Amazon audience and um, our US Embassy counterparts. Um, we were able to point them towards an event to work on, um, work on projects that would directly contribute to data quality in OSM. And so, and so that was a really um, educational experience for us. And it was really helpful because it's in having these conversations and in being open and accessible and available to each other that we're able to, you know, get from not just point A to point B, but point A to like point Z. Like you always find these, um, you know, you always get to unexpected conversations just by starting off. And so I wanted a big takeaway of this quick um, presentation to you all to be that we, just because we are um, a part of the US State Department doesn't mean that we're always looking abroad. We are, and it doesn't mean that we are inaccessible. We are very happy and eager to be well connected with, um, with as much of the open mapping community as possible. And with that, um, I'll, I'll let it go to the next person. It's really nice to, really nice to be here with everyone today. Oh, thanks, Erica. And that was a perfect segue. Um, to introduce Madison Musgrave from Maxar, who I know that you worked with on that mapathon, and you're right. Um, you know, you bring up things like coordination, communication, networking. How do we, uh, you know, engage and kind of reach across and, and make those connections? And this was one way that that did happen. And so, Madison, I'm going to hand it over to you, and I know you're going to discuss um, from now a different perspective from the the private side of how contributions can be made to uh, OSM and the community. Great, thank you, Josh. Thanks for having me here today. I don't think you all can probably tell, but I'm rocking, oh yeah, there you go. I'm rocking my uh, state of the map shirt from last year. So I wish we could all be together, but I am excited that we have this new forum to discuss. Um, so as Josh said, my name is Madison Musgrave and I am the Sustainable Development Goals Specialist at Maxar. 
Um, many of you may be familiar with Maxar. Um, we are a large satellite imagery provider and we provide um, many of the different base map options that are available in OSM. So I'm sure that many of you have created some awesome features using our imagery as the source data. Um, so at Maxar, I'm a part of our sustainable development team where we focus on working with NGOs and nonprofits that integrate our imagery and data into their different programs um, with the goal of trying to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm also the coordinator of the Open Data Program, which is what I'm here to talk to you all about today. So the Open Data Program was formed in 2017 and we wanted to create a way to better serve the humanitarian community that was responding to natural disasters. So that was our primary goal when we created the program was to remove those barriers so we could get the imagery and the data out there quickly so that um, organizations would be able to better utilize the data. We also wanted to create a community of geospatial excellence around disaster preparedness and response. And I really feel like we have done those two things in the creation and uh, you know, ongoing uh, actions of the open data program. So with the open data program, we release data in two kinds of um, events, either sudden onset natural disasters, which may include hurricanes, wildfires, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, things that I feel like are happening more and more often in 2020. Um, so for sudden onset natural disasters, my AirPods fell out. Uh, for sudden onset natural disasters, um, organizations may use our data to um, to analyze how the extent of the natural disasters. They can use the pre and post event comparison to understand, you know, how many structures were damaged, what roads are inaccessible. Um, they can use the imagery to plan egress and ingress routes to deliver um, supplies and to deliver aid and to better plan for natural disasters in the future. Um, the other kind of event that we have activated for is pandemics. So we did activate um, and released an extensive amount of information for the Ebola outbreak in 2018. And then we have released an, a very significant amount of data for the COVID-19 pandemic. So for those kinds of disasters, organizations are using our imagery to better understand where in this community could we place a field hospital? How far are um, people in this community located from health services? What would be the best way that we could best deliver supplies to reach the most amount of people? Um, in some communities, they were using it to analyze where isolation centers should be set up or how the, the different communities could best implement social distancing measures and uh, other protocols that are necessary um, to combat COVID-19. Um, so those are the two kinds of events that we generally activate for. And um, the full activation protocol is available on our site if anybody is interested in seeing you know, the full gamut of all the steps that we go through um, that is available on maxr.com slash open data. And I think Maggie will be sharing that out as well. Um, but what you are interested in is the data itself. So um, at a minimum, we always post pre and post event satellite imagery for every single event. That will be delivered to the site as a three band pan sharpen cloud optimized geotiff. That imagery is available on the site in perpetuity. So after an event ends or you know years later, that imagery is still available. So if you wanna go back and do some kind of analysis on a certain kind of natural disaster, that imagery is still there on the site. It doesn't go away. Um, and I do wanna mention that all of the data that is available on Maxar's open data program does have an OSM exception, which means that it is able to be um, posted and used in OSM. Sometimes we do uh, use other kinds of uh, data like building footprints, roads, vector um, analysis, damage analysis, hot maps, SWIR data for wildfires or weather reports. Um, and the last point I really wanna mention is the one of the really exciting things about the open data program is its flexibility and fluidity and our, our ability to try new things. So as Erica mentioned uh, earlier this year, we were able to provide some uh, machine learning data that we created in Nigeria that had some of these key health features, um, the organizations providing um, outreach in Nigeria to the COVID-19 pandemic would be interested in this. Uh, data was ready to be integrated and evaluated by uh, OpenStreetMap users and um, 
yeah, with that, I'm going to hand it, hand it back over because I know we're short on time. But if anybody wants to connect with me and talk any more about the open data program, I'm always happy to talk about it. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Madison. It was, uh, I think what you were alluding to is what Erica spoke of as well is, is that partnership of being able to um, run that mapathon, having the, the vectors available, the imagery available, and needing the crowd and kind of being able to bring the peanut butter and, and chocolate together. Uh, I want to now pivot over to Greg Matthews, also from uh, USGS. And so uh, Greg is not going to talk about um, a project or anything else. Greg is going to come give us some perspective. And um, while Greg and I are talking, if anyone has questions they want to put in the chat, I think we'll have a few minutes here at the end. Um, but Greg, you know, we're, I'll let you kind of start and maybe I'll ask you a question as you go along from the public perspective, how can we work better together? I know that Aaron mentioned uh, originally with, you know, the National Mapping Corp, right? It was started using OSM, then they were pivoted away. Is it hard to now kind of come back as the, the well poisoned, if you will, or, or how much work needs to happen? And what can we do better? What can we do to uh, encourage collaboration and, and not feel that you have to kind of pivot away from, from this community? Loaded questions across the board, I, I know. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk through some of that and I'll, I'll hit on those points. Um, hey, Greg, I think we, we may have lost your audio there for a second. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, better now. Okay, good. I also went dark. That was weird. Sunspots or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to, to some of those topics and, and um, just kind of ramble through this and, and uh, glad for folks to jump in and interrupt and we can just have a discussion. And I, I think I'm mostly maybe partially representing USGS, but mostly representing myself and my own uh, what, what I've seen throughout the last decade of trying to work within this community and, and work within um, crowdsourcing in general at the USGS. So as Aaron was saying, we had kind of conceived a project probably about 11 years ago. And I was one of the people that helped get that off the ground. When street map software stack and that worked honestly really well. And we didn't have the capabilities at the time to build our own infrastructure. Uh, we had spoken with Steve Coast and others within the community of, about, you know, the initiative and it was extremely helpful. The, the community was very helpful. We had some hop over from OSM community that, that got involved in our project early on to help us get off the ground. Um, we ended up doing our own development internally because we had multiple projects, not just the National Map Corps that were, we were uh, needing to support for crowdsourcing. So we ended up going with a different source. <clears throat> kind of complicated, but anyway, that's where we started. Um, just working through some of my points here. Um, so even though we were originally working with uh, the OSM software stack, you know, we, our project is exactly the same. Um, and as Aaron described, we go through a kind of a unique two-step or two and a half step process. We have a volunteer. We don't know who they are. They don't have to be certified. They don't have to be anything. It doesn't matter who they are. They're allowed to edit in the system. Once they have a certain amount of edits, uh, then they basically qualify to be a reviewer and they can check other people's edits. So it's a two-step process. And then we sit on top of that process and do random statistical sampling to make sure that the data coming out the other end always is, you know, meets our, our internal quality needs, which is extremely important to our program. And because in general, within the government environment, crowdsourcing has been, people have been a little bit skeptical about it. You know, we try to make the data 94, 95% quality or better. Um, and, it, it, and, you know, by the time we hit that second review, um, I can't speak for Aaron, but I believe we're hitting 100% quality with no detectable errors. That's really important to us. Um, it doesn't have to be that good, but it reflects extremely well on our crowdsourcing pr uh, program. Um, <coughs> there for a second. Oh, was somebody asking a question? No, we, we lost your audio there for a second right after you said the 100% quality, but let me ask you a quick, a quick question. Sure. Uh, with those quality metrics, is that something that is um, proprietary? Is that something that's relevant to just how your data is conditioned or is that something that could be shared back with the, the community at large, you know, and, and I guess maybe open that up to, to others on the panel as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that 
very quickly, we tried to build into our process early on to feed this data back to the OSM community. Um, there's a challenge there because uh, any kind of authoritative government data, while it's completely public domain, which is basically free and clear, you can use it, the data any way you want to. The challenge is how do you not override other contributions from the broader OSM community? And that's where I think originally we, we just didn't have any success. This data can be, can be added back to OSM by anybody at any time. We just haven't found an elegant way to do that. And we would love to close the gap on that if, if it were possible. So let me, let me hit on that really quickly. Um, so I think this is, I know we're gonna come up close on time and I may cash in the three minutes uh, from Maggie now. Um, how could, right, and this, I guess the, you know, the, the call to action or, or the, the take home point, right? How could the public, private, and, you know, we'll also call the, the independent groups, right? Because public we're kind of saying is a proxy for government and, and private is, you know, private industry. But there's that third larger community within OSM of just kind of independent uh, contributors, right? And so how can they, if they chose to or wanted to, how could they reach out or how could you reach out to them? Because you may have people that enjoy doing this on their own free time that would want to help contribute and put it out the open everyone else to use. How do we kind of break through the barrier to, to do that? Or how would you? Maybe I don't want to put all the pressure of the world on you or Aaron. I'll speculate or on that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how we completely tap on getting the data sound, but uh, w w you know Maggie and uh, and uh, USGS. That's you know that's me, and then Daryl Dudley from U.S. Department of Transportation and others are working on uh, standing up a, a demonstration of collecting within OSM the OSM environment. Uh, that that data would be collected to very specific uh, criteria um, and it would potentially go through that same two-step process that I was talking about and it would it would then potentially be subjected to you know random statistical sampling to make sure that it meets our quality needs but if we collect that within the OSM environment we, we could apply our own crowdsourcing folks our volunteers along with the OSM community really big picture here is out the other end. So if you have government or with OSM potentially do is you could crowdsource authoritative data, right? So if you have an authoritative agency sitting on the other end saying, yes, we certify this for a certain specific use, then you have crowdsourced authoritative data. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. To me, it's a really big deal if you could basically certify the data at the end. Um, not quite sure how it syncs back up to OSM yet, but I think we just need to begin investigating. We're talking about, again, standing up an application to test this. We're already talking about it. Yeah, that's that's great. And I know that, and, and Maggie, I will give you back at least a minute. I know that um, there is a, a government uh, or kind of a public partnership, public uh, enterprise committee that is being stood up and has been stood up by OSM US. And, you know, maybe the action is kind of leading the charge there of how do we start to interact and and work together. Um, I haven't seen any questions come up in the chat, um, so I don't want to necessarily take too much time. I will say that I'd encourage anybody here that's that's listening in. I know Madison put her email out. Um, you can definitely find a way to get in touch with us if you have any questions or just email Madison. Um, I do want. I know we want to keep keep them going. Um, we can definitely ask questions. Uh, in the chat and you can get, uh, we are happy to facilitate and farm those out uh, in the interest of time. And unfortunately we can't kind of meet in the hallway and continue to chat afterwards. Um, Maggie, I'm gonna hand it over back to you. Uh, Erica, Aaron, Madison, Greg, thank you so much for, for joining us and back to our, our regularly scheduled programming.